On this podcast, we go one step beyond publications and guidelines to speak directly with leading experts in interventional pulmonology. This podcast will address not only fundamental topics and exciting publications, but also unconventional topics for which the evidence base isn't that robust. The views expressed on this podcast are those of the speaker and not necessarily endorsed by the AABIP. This is your host, Odit Chadda, an assistant professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And with that, let's dive into the next episode. Today's tents still have several design features that you know, mitigate complications, uh, but still granulation tissue, migration, uh, and others are routinely encountered in everyday practice. Um, as with every stent talk, we talk about an ideal stent, uh, one that is biocompatible, biostable, perfectly fits the patient's anatomy, causes minimal interruption to clearance of secretions, is resistant to biofilm formation, easily can be placed and removed, eliminates migration, and it's inexpensive to make. So basically, there's no one stent that complies to all of these, but we're getting there. As you know, Dr. Thomas Kildare has championed the development of 3D printed stents that have recently acquired FDA approval, and we will be dedicating this episode to the discussion of these stents. Dr. Gildare is the head of the section of bronchoscopy in the Department of Pulmonary Allergy, Critical Care Medicine, and the Transplant Center in the Respiratory Institute at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. A prominent and distinguished physician, he is truly a giant in our field, and I am fortunate to have him with me on the podcast today. Thank you for joining me, Dr. Gildare. Thank you for having me. Before we start, do you have any uh, relevant conflicts of interest to disclose? I'm happy to say that I have an enormous one, uh, and I certainly (laughs) hope that it's an enormous one. Uh, I am the inventor of uh, this product that we're going to be talking a little bit about my work. Um, The Cleveland Clinic actually owns the entire uh, company and all the uh, aspects of the intellectual property that we filed, Uh, but I will be an inventor and hopefully will receive something either from the sale of the company or royalties or something, depending on how uh, the business is structured. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so let me start with a two-parted question. So could you tell us how and why you started generating 3D printed stents and what characteristics of the ideal stent that we talked about does a 3D printed stent address? So it's a great question. Uh, I started this particular idea years ago, um, I think probably 2013, 2014, somewhere in that time range. And, and that had to do with having large numbers of patients with really difficult problems. And there's one particular patient that uh, had sarcoidosis and had some challenges related to traction bronchiectasis. He ended up with uh, tracheobronchal megaly. But he was most troubled by uh, an obstructive characteristic that he was noticing uh, where he was getting repeated pneumonias and he had a seal barking cough. And the right-sided airway, although uh, very large, when he would cough, would completely shut down. Uh, And he had developed multiple infections, uh, eventually developing bronchiectasis. But the challenge to him was not just stenting the right side. It was stenting the right side with an an airway that was almost 18 millimeters. His distal trachea was well over 20 millimeters. And everything I tried to put in there would either get loose very quickly or migrate. And he really suffered tremendously. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to find a solution to make him a stent, and there just really wasn't anything large enough to sit there, hold its position well. So I started doing, uh, working with some of the ideas I'd seen with the Japanese papers where they had um, hand-sewn stents together. And I tried to build something for him, but I just never really got anywhere with it. When I eventually looked at the idea of 3D printing, I I looked at his CAT scan and three-dimensional reconstruction, and I realized quickly that it wasn't just the size, it was also the shape and the the nature of his airway was so dynamic, I I just didn't have a good solution. And so I started the process of addressing his case, and then I quickly noticed that there were lots of cases of patients that I had taken care of over time, particularly lung transplant patients, where... The stent would fit on one end where it was you know, wide and it was very narrow on the other end or a branch point came into play mm-hmm. or particularly Y stents, they just never really sat very well with people with significant carina disease. And so as it came to clear to me that there needs to be a more customized solution for individuals with these very unusual anatomies, that one, it was very 
very much more common than I thought it was. And then two, that the solutions we had out of the boxes were just completely ineffective. And so I started working on sewing stents together and uh, altering different stent materials, changing uh, the angles of the branches, a mm-hmm. lot like the work I would seen other folks do. And it turned out it worked pretty well. Um, but over time, just like any other stent, we started to see all the different problems with stent fit. And even though I got pretty good at sewing things together, I still couldn't make all the adjustments I wanted. If I wanted it to curve in a certain way or if I wanted to take pressure off the distal end, uh, things just didn't work as well as I'd like. Mm-hmm. So looking at the CT scans and imagining modeling for these sorts of things, I could say I could just use the scan as a model and then hand make things. But then getting into the idea that silicone as the only material I knew how to use um, in and of itself was challenging. So you know, looking at multiple things, one, stent fit. I thought that up front, if I had a, a stent that would fit anything, uh, I could probably solve most of the problems that we come across. Uh, looking at work from David uh, Ost, seeing that you know, stents that get infected, the infection contributes to granulation. Mm-hmm. And then that becomes a, a problem where infection and granulation go hand in hand. I figured, well, if I can adjust fit and granulation was less a problem, then infection would be less of a problem. But still, you know, silicone stents still have a tendency to adhere to things. Mm-hmm. Um, silicone stents are very easy to put in. They're very easy to take out. Uh, we've had plenty of experience, take, you know, implanting metal stents, which are easy to put in, but very difficult to take out uh, mm-hmm. if they get granulated. Um, and although silicone was, uh, particularly Y stents, can be relatively easy to put in, and the really complex geometries that can be very, very difficult to put in. So I was looking at all the different aspects at once, trying to solve multiple problems because I just kept seeing variations on the, on the same several themes. And the most, the most obvious one to me was fit. And so uh, I took off on the pathway of customization with the idea of solving fit first and then see what was left after that. So, so fit basically means you are trying to mitigate granulation tissue formation and migration simultaneously. Yes, and you know how to get the stent in right. Perfect. Uh, but I've heard that silicone is not 3D printable. Is that correct? It sort of is not. Um, the, the idea is that it's an elastomer and not a polymer. 3D printers are really designed for polymers, as I understand it, and that the silicone properties, the chemical properties of silicone, that it re- uh, are that it requires a um, curing function. And so medical-grade silicone can be made into any number of shapes, but it requires a, a, a process where you heat these things under extraordinary, not extraordinary, but under pressure, Mm-hmm. Uh, and that would leave the silicone in a in the appropriate way that's necessary for its final shape and its characteristics. Um, there are machines out there now that might be able to 3D print a silicone directly. I've heard stories about this, but th- this is sort of not where we were. Silicone is not 3D printable uh, as I know it to be, uh, and, and that, again, was um, a challenge that we're going to have yet to address. So uh, can you describe briefly the process that you go through when you make your 3D printed stents? I mean, right from looking at the CT scan or the bronchoscopic measurements you take uh, before you go through this. Sure. So it's really a two or three part step. So one is the clinical decision. So first and foremost, it's important to know that we do everything humanly possible not to ever stent anybody. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a common construct is that if you don't have to stent someone, if you could find anything else possible to do, then that we don't stent them. Once we come to the decision that we have to stent them, then it becomes a, a description or a discussion I'm having trouble here. about all the different variables that we have to adjust for. And for this, it's really looking at the 3D uh, reconstructions of the airway. Um, we take some measurements just looking at the, the thing. Bronchoscopically, I do an airway examination and try to address what I need to do, either with balloon dilation, laser, whatever needs to be done inside the airway, mm-hmm. and then come up with what I imagine the mental picture of the stent to be. The software that we developed um, comes out of just airway uh, segmentation. We get a three-dimensional model of the airway, and then I overlay what the ideal stent is on top of that diseased airway using the patient's own anatomy as my guide. So rather than being extraordinarily descriptive about every aspect of length and diameter, I let the airway be the base model, and then I make adjustments to that uh, uh, segmented 3D airway that I think would be clinically relevant. Once I have those parameters uh, in my head and sort of uh, using the tools in the computer, 
that would generate a model of the 3D printed stent. And then the stent goes, um, uh, that stent is turned into a CAD model. Mm -hmm. And the negative of that stent is turned into a mold. Uh, the mold is then 3D printed. The medical grade silicone is injected into the mold. Uh, it's removed from the mold and it's uh, post-process pr you know, production. And then it's ready for us to implant. So it's, it's lots of different things. Uh, the clinical assessment bronchoscopically is almost as equally important as the CT scan, but the CT scan becomes the base model upon which we work. So from the day you decide that you want to place a 3D printed stent to having the stent ready in front of you, how long does that take? Right now, it's about five to seven days, uh, although uh, it could be significantly shortened. There's lots of different steps involved. Um, the, the, the two slowest steps right now are the... Uh, airway segmentation right now for really complicated airways some of the computers that are some of the programs we use to do segmentation require a, a an engineer or a technician to go through and find out where the airway separates um, some software packages seem to have done this very well for example the navigation system software is automatically mm -hmm. segment robots automatically segment. but but generally they're not very good with small airways and they're not really good with a really complex twisted up airway so uh, there is some engineer work that goes into that, but that hopefully is just a software solution away. And then the manufacturing, the uh, the big, the biggest rate limiting step on manufacturing is how long it takes the 3D printer to make the mold. So mm -hmm. the, there used to be steps where someone would manually convert the 3D prescription into a CAD file. Now that's automated. And then the process of uh, transmitting that into a mold had some additional steps um, but really, the 3D printing is one of the slower things. And again, that may be a solved with faster 3D printers. Um, the pressure, the silicone injection and um, mold curing process is not particularly long. And then there's the post-processing where we take everything out of the mold and polish it up. So several different steps along that way. The, some of the slow ones that are easily fixed we're working on with regard to the software uh, automation. Uh, and then, of course, it's the 3D printers in there. So lots of different steps in the technology could be adjusted, and hopefully we'll shorten that by a number hmm. of days over time. Yeah, that's awesome. And hopefully one day we'll step away from this one-size-fits-all dogma. As of today, though, I mean, and maybe for the next few years, we, we can say that 3D printed stents will be the exception rather than the norm. Um, so let's say, uh, Dr. Gilder, I have a patient with a complex airway and I think needs a 3D printed stent. Tried everything I can. My my silicone stents have migrated or I've tried different sizes. Uh, is there a process in place right now for me to order a 3D printed stent if I need one? Uh, it should be open shortly. We have, Since the um, FDA uh, clearance, the 510K clearance some months ago, uh, the process we've been working on is really just business stuff, uh, figuring out how to stand up a business. And then COVID happened. Mm -hmm. uh, since COVID happened and everybody was working from home, most things stopped. But the plan will be going forward is once we work on the uh, standing up of the business work and ordering and all that stuff, it really will come down to a web-based uh, order system. And the process will be that you will upload your patient's CAT scan through a HIPAA compliant um, web portal. Uh, it's Google based. It'll go through whatever process that is. The um, It'll be received by the company and the company will um, uh, provide you a username and password and you'll do training on how to do it and that's pretty much how it works it should be available to the public very shortly i, I don't know um, what all the barriers are to that right now we're still working mm -hmm. on alpha launch but but that's the process it'll be purely web-based and all you have to do is upload your ct that's awesome all right. And um, with you, I mean, going through the process, it seems like it's very complicated to make and requires a lot of equipment. So would it be possible for you to share with us as to what the estimated cost of the stent would be? I don't know the costs exactly. The costs, uh, it's strange. They are material costs, which are not terribly high. So the cost of the printer itself, the cost of the 3D printed materials, uh, the cost of the silicone itself are, are marginal. Mm -hmm. uh, the real cost is the person time. So the engineering part, the time it takes to do all the steps in the manufacturing are really where the cost comes in. And some of that is variable based on scaling. Yeah. So it could be a couple of thousand dollars up to a thousand dollars or so per stent at the moment, just because of person time. But as we figure out how to scale faster, it'll become cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that I could give you a, a straight answer about that. Yeah. It, you yeah, know, it could be a couple hundred dollars or less at some point. It just depends on uh, a lot of factors I don't understand. 
And for our listeners, those prices sound very comparable to existing stents. I mean, silicone stents cost anything from $600 to $700 approximately, and SEMS can be up to $2,500. All right, that's great. Um, In terms of uh, the target population, at least initially, this sounds like something that would be for patients who have longer survival, so benign airway stenosis, right? Yes. Yeah, right now it is purely based on the idea that people have enough time uh, to one, decide that they need a stent, and two, have time to wait and get the stent they need. Uh, Certainly, we've had individuals who we've placed these things in under an emergency protocol where they were failing dramatically with existing stents, and we were able to get these placed pretty quickly under an emergency protocol. But again, the idea is that you're going to live long enough to derive the benefits. Much like we know about metal stents, uh, metal stents uh, left in long enough will fail. Mm -hmm. Uh, They will fail from metal fatigue. They'll fail from the coatings falling apart. They'll eventually fail. Silicone stents similarly will become infected. Uh, Even though I've seen some in for a decade, you know, almost a decade or longer, uh, eventually Mm -hmm. they do all fail. So uh, the challenge, of course, is to look for the patient in whom the stent is useful and who will have enough time to derive benefit from all the complexities of these things. They still can be changed out. Right now, the manufacturers of the silicone stents, the regular silicone stents on the market now, the package insert says they're supposed to be left in for a year. Uh, and, you know, we would hope that all of our patients who get stented live a year, but it turns out it's mm-hmm. not the case a lot of lung cancer patients. So for benign diseases, it seems to be our best uh, target population. Right now, we're approved for Y stents only. So we, we got through some of the testing around migration by focusing on Y stents as our first offering. And so uh, it's really going to be looking at either tracheobronchial Y stents or bronchial distal bronchial Y stents as our uh, first population. And those are pretty much all Mm -hmm. uh, patients with complex benign disease. Okay, awesome. And just regarding the technical aspects and management, I presume the loading, the deploying, the maintenance are as much like any other silicone stent? Yeah, right now we've designed them exclusively to work with the existing uh, rigid bronchoscope systems that we have. In fact, we used just the Um, Brian Dumont system as our model. Our packaging really just speaks to it fitting into the standard set that we have with the Brian Dumont loading set. Uh, We could put some things that are a little larger in, obviously, but we haven't validated that outside with any of the Stortz equipment, for example, uh, or things like more larger y stents that you could place without putting in the load system. But right now, it's completely designed to be used uh, with existing loading systems. Awesome. So, I mean, we've all seen your presentations uh, about the cases you've presented and the data, of course, so far, just given that this is such a rare indication, is limited to case series, um, again, from very few expert centers. Uh, Are there any ongoing trials looking at 3D printed stents? Where do we go from here? So uh, there will be a uh, prospective registry trial or trial uh, in the works. Again, a lot of this had to do with the funding we had available um, when COVID hit. (laughs) So we do have a trial that we would like to conduct. And then once we sort of get our first 20 or 30 patients uh, through that system, then it'll be open for other people to study at will. And then, of course, the ability to fund studies will be based on where we can find money. (laughs) So... Uh, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to study it. I'm, I'm looking actually forward to the opportunity that other people study it. I will be hopefully conflicted enough such that I have to step away from the studies at some point. And I'm hoping that, of course, uh, people find better ways to do this than I am. <laughs> we all know that there are folks out there doing work like this, and there are some really, really smart people in the world um, working on these things. And I hope that this tool will help advance the field enough so that someone much smarter than me takes it to the next level. Well, absolutely. Hopefully we do reach the next level. And congratulations again on this fantastic achievement. Uh, I hope this is the final nail in the coffin for the Frankenstein. <laughs> uh, Let's hope so. Uh, although, you know, you know, these emergencies, you could really do some cool things if you get that practice. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, so, I, I like the idea of the temporary stent. You know, we, we, if you need to temporarily stent someone and get, keep them alive, then you move on to these other things. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity. Exactly. Uh, any closing comments, Dr. Kildare? No, this has uh, been an exciting time for us. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of this field. I think one of the greatest things about our specialty is the uh, opportunity to think on the fly and be uh, innovative in our approach. And, and I love that our field embraces these things and uh, looking forward to how you guys take the world further than I could ever do it. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you for your time. This has been absolutely wonderful. And I'm sure our listeners will appreciate all your pearls of wisdom. <laughs> Thanks so much. With that, we conclude an exciting episode here on the AABIP podcast. 
I hope you guys enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed hosting it. Do also check out our website, theippodcast.com, and please do provide us with feedback and suggestions on what topic and which expert you want to hear next. Until next time, take care.